Tonight's discussion is entitled Reckoning with Racial Injustice in the United States. Joining us, we have Darren Walker of the Ford Foundation and Sherilyn Eiffel of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And they're joined here by, of course, David Tolbert of the International Center for Transitional Justice, which is, of course, the co-convener of the lecture. So it's not my role to introduce our incredible speakers. Instead, I'm gonna welcome them, welcome you, and say a few, very few words about um, the lecture itself and why this conversation is important to the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice. The Center is extremely pleased to partner in this lecture with the ICTJ, and we're truly thrilled to host Darren Walker and Sherilyn Eiffel tonight. I want to thank them both, along with David Tolbert, for taking time from their demanding schedules to come for a reflective dialogue with us. The Emilio Mignoni Lecture was born of a long-standing collaboration between the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice and the ICTJ. We've been co-organizing lecture for 10 years, um, since 2007. The lecture is named after the Argentine lawyer and advocate Emilio Mignoni, who was one of the most important human rights defenders in Argentina during the so-called Dirty War. <clears throat> His own daughter, who was an advocate for slum dwellers, was disappeared by the Argentine government in 1976. A firm believer in due process and rule of law, he believed that he would be able to obtain his daughter's release by challenging her arbitrary detention in court. He never saw his daughter again. We honor him with this lecture series to keep alive his contributions to human rights and transitional justice. We honor him because he turned what could have been despair into action. Action not only on his daughter's behalf, but on behalf of all of those who had been disappeared or tortured and all of the families who were left behind. By founding the Centro de Estudios Legales y Sociales, or CELS, in Buenos Aires in 1979, Mignoni embodied the spirit of speaking truth to power, fighting for human rights, and seeking what would later come to be known as transitional justice. CELS was central to the effort to systematically document, denounce, and legally challenge human rights abuses committed by the military during the Argentine dictatorship. Today, CELS is one of the most important voices in Latin America for the fight for human rights and democracy. The work of Emilio Mignoni and CELS has been felt across the world. The work they undertook to document grave abuses during Argentina's most painful moments has been crucial to later attempts to bring those violations and the dynamics behind them into the light. This effort to uncover not only violations but also their root causes is especially relevant for tonight's discussion about where we find ourselves historically in this moment in the United States. The work of Emilio Mignoni and CELS has been inspiring to the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice, which endeavors to use our position at a top US law school to advance scholarship and action in the name of truth and justice. We're honored to be led in this work by Professor Philip Alston, who's himself documented myriad cases of disappearance and killing during his time as Special Rapporteur on extrajudicial executions, and who now spends his time prodding governments and powerful international actors to protect the rights of those living the intersecting human rights violations of extreme poverty. In December, Philip and his team will visit the United States for an important investigation into the lives of people in poverty here in our country. He'll examine their experiences, their organizing efforts, and the forces of power that rendered them and keep them without the crucial resources they need and which are their human rights. We're also honored to learn every day from the work of Professor Pablo de Grief, who serves as the director of the Center's Transitional Justice Program. Professor de Grief's work as Special Rapporteur, on here comes the title, <laughs> on the promotion of truth, justice, reparation, and guarantees of non-recurrence, has cut a pioneering path forward by focusing not only on the legal <coughs> rights of victims, but also the moral requirements of truth and accountability for the entire society. Before we move on tonight's program, I want to say a few words about the purpose of the lecture, which is the cornerstone of our collaborative relationship with the ICTJ. The annual lecture is one attempt to break the logjam of injustice by fostering sometimes unsettling dialogue. Dialogue between academics and practitioners, between scholars and advocates in the global north and the global south, dialogue between groups that have been at opposite ends of the blade of injustice. And these dialogues are always with the goal of pushing for a deeper understanding of the mechanisms that led to human rights violations, that foster impunity, and that hamper the quest for truth and accountability, which in turn can foster 
and enable transition to a more just society. Since its inception, the goal of this lecture has been to foster this kind of conversation and to think in innovative ways, ways that can move us toward meaningful understanding and more effective action. Previous speakers in this series include Professor Jose Zaliket, Madame Louise Arbor, Aria Nair, Judge Thomas Bergenthal, Richard Goldstone, and the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Tonight we examine one of the most charged and salient structural, institutional, and endemic causes of inequality in this country, racial injustice founded on institutionalized white privilege. In a moment of increasing hate crimes against people of color, impunity for police killings of African Americans, demonization and blaming of immigrants, and emboldened white supremacy, this discussion is crucially important. Indeed, we're in a moment you might say, of brokenness for our democracy. As Brian Stevenson has said, in moments of brokenness, new ways can open if we acknowledge our brokenness by facing it head on, by speaking its truth. We can, as he says, find the connections that forge our common humanity. We're honored tonight to have two gifted leaders with us to engage in this discussion. My colleague, Fernando Travesi, Executive Director of the ICTJ will now introduce the speakers. Thank you. Good evening. I want to welcome everybody on behalf of ICTJ, my colleagues that are here, we welcome you all. I just want to say first, before the introductions, that all those who have sat down to talk to or to hear the personal story of a victim of torture, or a family member of someone who was forcibly disappeared, a woman or a man who was raped or sexually abused during violent time, or anyone who had to leave everything behind to seek refuge in a neighboring country, in many cases to remain in exile for the rest of their lives, all of them would fully understand victims' demands for justice with no need or further explanations. And all those would fully understand as well that coping and dealing with the impact and consequences of serious human rights violation is a long life challenge. That challenge <coughs> unfolds in multiple phases, shapes, and ups and downs over time. It certainly can define the life story and the characters of individuals, even while it impacts on families and entire communities, which in one way or another are burdened with the legacies of the crimes for years to come, generation to generation. But what if we were not talking about just one person? What if victims of human rights violations are counted by thousands, ten or hundreds of thousands, or even millions? What to do? Where to start? How can a society deal with such massive past criminality? It is not an easy task. Confronting the legacy of massive human rights violation is a long journey full of questions and dilemmas. Some of them are legal, many others are political, social, ethical, and philosophical. And they live at both the individual and collective level. When the scope of criminality is massive and the number of victims is overwhelming, the process of bringing justice and building peaceful and inclusive societies is not an easy task how much we can know about what happened, how are the details of thousands of crimes to be uncovered, why did they happen, what's the truth about the individual experience and what's the impact in the society, what groups have been especially affected, who benefited, what role do the different social and political narratives about violence play, whom is served by the official narrative, how much denial of violence has been normalized through the years? How can we repair those who suffered? How can we make accountable those more responsible? In fact, how can we stop the cycles of violence? All of these questions, and many more, must be answered to be able to bring some degree of justice to victims and to confront a painful past in a way that is able to change the community, putting in place some measures to address the consequences of violence and prevent its repetition from happening again and build a more peaceful and inclusive society. These questions are so vast and are so many and so complex 
That is all what we do at the International Center for Transitional Justice. We have specialized on these processes. We work across societies and borders with governments, international organizations, with victims <coughs> groups and civil society to find their own answers to, this, to these questions, to design solutions that are unique and specifically suited to them, and to implement them. ICTJ has worked in more than 50 countries around the world, some of them in the aftermath of an armed conflict, others after a period of violent political repression, authoritarian regimes, or dictatorships. But we also we, we work in countries like Syria where the conflict is still going on and advising, and we work also advising and contributing to peace negotiations. We also do work in well-established democracies where legacies of violence remain unresolved, perpetuating injustice against whole communities for generations. And that's why we are here tonight, to reflect and discuss about how the United States can recon with its history of slavery, how transitional justice can contribute to confront racial injustice in this country. And we could not dream for a better panel to do that tonight. We have here Darren Walker, president of the Ford Foundation, as everybody know, and a longtime leader in the nonprofit and philanthropic sectors. He has led the philanthropic, philanthrop, philanthropic committee, sorry, that helped bring in a resolution the city of Detroit's historic bankruptcy, and also chairs the US Impact Investing Alliance. Previously, he served as vice president at the Rockefeller Foundation, where, among many other things, he managed the initiative to rebuild New Orleans after the Hurricane Katrina. And he also led the Harlem's largest community development organization, the Abyssinian Development Corporation, Corporation, where he oversaw a comprehensive revitalization program. With him, we have Serraline Ilfeld, president and director of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, a powerful woman who is leading the work of her organization in the most urgent, most urgent civil rights issue of the country, including policy reform, border suppression, and housing discrimination. Previously, he feels successfully litigated voting rights cases and worked as a fellow at the American Civil Liberty Unions and taught at the University of the Maryland School of Law. She's also an acclaimed author whose book can be bought at the entrance. David Tolbert, is moderating this panel. He is the president at the International Center for Transitional Justice. He previously served at the, as UN Assistant Secretary General, including as a special advisor on the Khmer Rouge trials, and later as Register of the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. He was the Deputy Chief Prosecutor for the UN Yugoslavia <coughs> Tribunal, where he served in senior positions for almost a decade. But maybe more importantly tonight, David started his life in the segregated South, came from a family that had opposed slavery, secession, and segregation, and his grandfather was an attorney in South Carolina who fought against the Klan and for civil <coughs> rights, ending his own life after suffering constant harassment and violence from the Klan. I'm sure the knowledge, the experience, and motivation of the three of you will make a great conversation tonight that will inspire thoughts and actions, because we all need to take actions. A few, a few weeks ago, I finished with this, my nephew, who is 11, 11 years old, asked me why there was no justice in the world. Oh. I replay saying that there were some justice in it, but unfortunately not for anyone. And we all need to work harder. I told him that we all needed to work harder because the solution depends on, on all of us, on what of each of us think and say and the actions that we can take tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you. David. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Thank you, Meg, uh, for those great introductions. Uh, we have a tough, we have tough act uh, to follow now. Uh, I know. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I want to thank our colleagues at NYU and also, of course, Philip Alston. You know, I read Philip Alston's books uh, and articles way back when I was studying human rights, but I want to assure Philip I was a very mature student when I did that. <laughs> um, uh, it's always, and it's always great to see Pablo de Greif, who's here with us as well. Thank God that uh, Meg took care of his title, uh, so I don't have to say it again. 
Uh, but uh, Pablo worked very, was at ICTJ and the founding of ICTJ, and we worked very closely to him before the UN and NYU stole him away. But uh, it's great to see him tonight, and it's great to have a number of our board members here and friends uh, from ICTJ. Um, so this is a conversation uh, that we'll try to get started. Uh, there's a lot to cover. Um, just kind of to uh, add a little bit to what Fernando has just said, I think one of the things that uh, we really want to look at tonight is uh, we've got a very difficult situation in the United States, both politically and on racial issues. Um, and the, you know, the, the attack on African Americans and on a whole variety of minorities. We've got, uh, we're one, one day after an election that occurred a year ago that I think shook us all in many ways. Uh, so we, and, and, given, uh, and given the developments that have occurred, uh, we particularly wanted to talk about the relevance of transitional justice here in the United States. Um, Transitional justice evolved, as uh, Fernando has already talked about, uh, in countries that have experienced a transition to democracy uh, or transitions away from massive human rights abuses, genocide, um, some of the places uh, I've worked in. And we, uh, special measures have been, had to be taken, including truth-telling processes, criminal prosecutions, reparations, reforms. And there's a very deep linkage in all the places that we work with civil society, with victims, and with the ultimate goal of reconciliation. Um, and the word transition sometimes causes people some misunderstandings um, because the concept evolved very much in Latin America and some other uh, contexts where uh, there was a transition from authoritarianism or dictatorship to democracy. I believe, and I think many of us believe, that the experience that has developed across the world in these transitions can be, at least in part, very useful for the United States to engage with in terms of the issues that we face, and particularly in terms of the, uh, the current political environment. So I'm delighted to be able to speak with these two great experts and friends uh, about, about these issues. Darren, I thought I would start with you, if it's okay to pick on you first. Uh, and uh, I was quite struck by your letter, A Call for Moral Courage in America. I think many of you saw this, in which you talk about, um, you point out the United States that unlike other countries like Germany, South Africa, have really failed to address the past. You say, a past marred by injustice and hate. You noted the uh, the terrible events that happened in Charlottesville um, very recently, and that we had been really been trying and failing to have a conversation about justice for the whole of American history. So those were your words. You underlined that the, after the Civil War, America made no sustained effort toward what some today might call transitional justice. No reparations for the freed slaves, no delivery on 40 acres and a mule, uh, no truth processes, and frankly, history books that were full of lies and misrepresentations. I think you and I probably both had history books that were full of lies and misrepresentations. So at this juncture, I was really, at, and where we stand in the United States with this deeply troubled past, how do we connect the present injustices to the past wrongs? How do we begin to address them, particularly in this difficult political situation? Thank you, David. <laughs> and it's a great honor to uh, be here tonight and to be with my dear friend, Cheryl and Ifo. Yeah. And um, I'm enormously gratified that people would turn out <laughs> and <don't> hear us <laughs> talk. But it's really great. And I'm really, really thankful. And um, this question that you raise is a really yeah. fundamental one for our country, our right. nation, our identity. Uh, and I wrote those words mm -hmm. because um, as part of a larger understanding of America's seeming inability to reconcile uh, the contradiction that is America and our need to, our desperate need 
to have one narrative, mm -hmm. a narrative of exceptionalism first, mm -hmm. which impairs our capacity to do the truth telling that is necessary for justice. Mm -hmm. We as a people have constructed a romanticized, mythologized mm -hmm. narrative of who we have been as a people. And, and thus, today, can't reconcile what is more potently on a video camera and in so many other ways, the, the clarity to give us the truth. Mm -hmm. And the difficulty of that and making that transition mm -hmm. is exceptionally hard for us. Mm -hmm. And it is partly why models that were developed in Germany or South Africa and other places are so disregarded as not even relevant mm -hmm. by so many people. Mm -hmm. The other reason it's, quite honestly, disregarded is because if we're really honest with ourselves, white people in America do not think what happened to enslaved Africans is anything as horrible as the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. They don't. I grew up in the American South. Mm -hmm. And the idea of most whites I encountered was, yes, it was horrible, but you are better off than you would be if you were over in that third world continent. And look at all of this opportunity you have. Mm -hmm. And for many, the economic reality, mm -hmm. which is, we had no desire to do what the Germans did. In fact, we insured you, like our other chattel, mm -hmm. to ensure that you survived, or at least some of you survived, mm -hmm. so that you could be the backbone of this capitalist economy. Mm -hmm. Because without you, we could not have built this country. And so why would we possibly want to do what the Germans did, or these bad people. Mm -hmm. And the, that, that reality yeah. is what is the truth of when people say, as so many people say, why can't America learn from Germany, learn from, well, we, we don't think we did anything that bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's, at the <laughs> fundamental level, that's why. Unfortunately, I think you're absolutely right. But how do we change that narrative? How do we? Oh, we change that narrative yeah. by having institutions like yours and right. this in, this law school and right. people like Cheryl and and Brian and so many others mm -hmm. who are actually changing that narrative. Right. I think we have made tremendous progress as a society in reconciling those contradictions. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, we have made huge progress. And we see people today, we see the sentiment expressed by people about, uh, is racism a problem in our society? Mm -hmm. um, do we need to redress past racial wrong? I mean, there, there is growing, uh, there is at least a growing recognition. Mm -hmm. It may uh, be, not joined by concrete action. Um, I think that is, that's the issue. But I think that we are making huge progress mm -hmm. around the narrative because ultimately that's the issue. The issue is we can't reconcile those narratives and we are beginning to reconcile them and we're beginning to mm -hmm. tell truths about them. But it's really hard. It's really hard because we need to believe we are better we desperately need to believe as a nation that there is some, something remarkably exceptional mm. 
We have been told that since mm -hmm. de Tocqueville, that there mm -hmm. is something special about this country and our people. And when you say to some audiences today, as I recently did, mm -hmm. if you want the American dream, go to Canada. <laughs> because we, for those of us who believe in the mythology mm -hmm. that we are a country of mobility, mm -hmm. the incontrovertible data are so shocking when we actually learn that today there is less social mobility in the United States than there is in almost any other European country, mm -hmm. including Germany and France, mm -hmm. and now the UK, right. the most classes of the Western countries. And so when we, a nation that has believed that class doesn't really matter, because mm -hmm. you can be born anywhere and it doesn't matter who your parents are. So we have this mythology that we desperately need to continue to perpetuate. And then when the evidence is put in our face, we just simply said, that just can't be. Mm -hmm. That just can't be. Well, it is. Mm -hmm. That's who we are. Are you seeing any response when the evidence is put into people's yes. face? Yes, yeah. I think yeah. people are coming to grips with it. But, but we have this, the challenge of a society where there is growing inequality mm -hmm. is the binary of those of us, and we, I consider myself quite privileged, those of us right. who are privileged, all of the systems and structures that have been architected around us all push us forward, all advance mm -hmm. us. And all of the systems and structures that disadvantage some of us compound that disadvantage in a society where mm -hmm. that is growing more unequal. And so to, and to, so to deconstruct that mm -hmm. takes real intervention. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the challenge. That's mm -hmm. the challenge. How do we actually get people to see that an intervention is needed. Right. And the intervention can't be a tax policy that ends the estate tax mm -hmm. and takes away money from, from education that makes a higher education more expensive. Mm -hmm. So the, the very same people who say education, 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 mm -hmm. it is the mobility escalator, that's what's going to and we want to make it less accessible mm -hmm. in a time when inequality is growing. Right. Yep. Any other interventions that you would? Uh, Sherilyn's got the better I, interventions. I, I, she's <laughs> she's so, who you I'm want to talk to. I'm okay. <laughs> I had some other questions for you, Sherilyn, but but why not that no, to no, begin no, with? No, ask me your other questions. I'm still thinking about the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we had this all worked out. <laughs> uh, well, Sherilyn, your book uh, on the courthouse lawn is a very, very powerful book, uh, particularly for someone like myself who grew up in the South and uh, heard a lot about lynchings. You, uh, and one of the things that I, I was a little, I thought, you know, you, you think of lynchings in terms of Alabama and Georgia, um, the Deep South, Mississippi. But you looked at the eastern shore of uh, Maryland, and you documented a whole variety of lynchings. And the impact that that had on those communities, not just on one generation, but many generations. And it reminds me of a personal story before I ask the question. Um, as was mentioned, you know, my family was an anti-slavery family in the South, and they were Republicans when Republicans were the party of Lincoln and so forth. And there was a a riot in a very small town in South Carolina when essentially African Americans lost the right to vote entirely in 1898. There was a massacre of 13 people. Most, a number of my ancestors were shot and so forth. And I've been back in that community several times and I've talked to them. They still talk about that and it's, what, 125 years later? Maybe not 20, my math, obviously I didn't do a math degree, 119 years later, they are still talking about it. They, they don't have the facts exactly, but they know something yes. happened. Yeah. And when I read your very powerful book, I was you know, very moved about that. 
And I thought it would be interesting maybe for you to tell a little bit about what you found. But also, you had some interesting proposals to, to deal with uh, to address that. Um, Quasi-truth commissions, or I think you called reconciliation processes. So I'd be interested, I'm sure the audience would be interested in the work you did on that, but also how do you, how do you try to unpack that and, and tackle those issues? This many years I later. I want to hear more about this South Carolina example. Okay, it's well, very interesting. But, but, but I'm the moderator. So. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, thank you very much yeah, for, for the yeah. invitation to be with you. And um, I've, I've known about the work of, of the International Center for Transitional Justice for some right. time and been a, a great admirer. And of course, as soon as I heard that um, I was invited to speak with Darren Walker, the answer was yes, because he's amazing. And I wish I had my little notepad so I could write things down. Um, but actually, I also wanted to talk about yeah. this at this moment uh, in sure, this country sure. because yeah. I wrote uh, this book in, uh, almost 10 years ago. Actually, yeah, yeah. they're going to do an anniversary edition next year. Yeah. Um, and I wrote the book not because I was a legal historian or because uh, this was kind of my area of work. I was a civil rights lawyer. Mm -hmm. I had been a civil rights lawyer at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And now I had gone to the University of Maryland Law School to begin teaching. And um, I started a course um, in environmental justice, and it was a kind of quasi-clinical course, so we represented clients. And in any case, I was doing a civil rights case with my students in which we were challenging the decision of, um, of the state to cite a highway directly adjacent to an African-American community. And mm -hmm. in our um, investigations, we discovered that this was the third time that the state had you know, put a highway through this community, and mm -hmm. so we were kind yeah. of putting the action together. And in the course of investigating the case and talking with people in the community, a curious thing happened that had happened to me in every case that I had litigated when I was a lawyer at the Legal Defense Fund, mm -hmm. which is that when I asked about the history of discrimination in that jurisdiction, um, African Americans would tell me something about some violent act of racism mm -hmm. that had happened mm -hmm. in the past. Um, when I, when I, I did a case, a voting rights case in uh, Oklahoma, that was where I first learned about the Tulsa race riots. And right, this was maybe right. in 1990. So I go to this community and I hear about this lynching or lynchings. Some people mm -hmm. said there was more than one. Right. And um, like your experience with South Carolina, they didn't yeah. have all the details, no, right? right. <laughs> but, but it was a powerful story and, and people knew about this story. Here's what was interesting for me. Um, so I, I learned about the lynching, and I began to do a little bit of research just to understand what mm -hmm. happened, mm -hmm. really for the case that I was litigating, not because right. I intended to write this book or anything. I learned that there were two lynchings, one that happened in 1931 and one mm -hmm. that happened in 1933. What was incredibly powerful was that African Americans described what happened uh, to these two young men, um, one of whom was lynched on a Friday night um, before a crowd of 500 people, and one of whom was lynched um, really kind of in the early evening before a crowd of 2,000 people in two very mm -hmm. small towns on the eastern shore of Maryland. They described it in detail, mm -hmm. and they knew all about it, you know, and it, and it was powerful for them. Even though I knew that for the most part, African Americans who can describe a lynching, or, but they were not present, right, yeah. because this was this incredibly um, violent and fearful act. And yet they had this, I can only call it memory. It was that they had a memory mm -hmm. of an event mm -hmm. that they were not present at. Mm -hmm. And by contrast, when I talked to folks in the white community, right. there was almost kind of complete denial. Oh, right. um, I, I mean, I remember people saying uh, that it happened in another town, mm -hmm. that um, I was speaking to some elderly white people who said that was before I was born. And I was like, no, 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 you, you, you were actually <laughs> in high school then. Like, can you, do you remember it? And actually, the Wicomico High School football team was like there at the lynching. They were right. having dinner across the street, and they came out to That's watch. Right. That's right. Um, and, but there was a kind of denial. And mm -hmm. so trying to understand those two things. And at the same time, I had just returned from South Africa, where mm -hmm. the truth and reconciliation process right. was happening. Right. And I was so engage with this idea of people speaking truthfully about mm -hmm. these, about something terrible, about yeah. terrible events. And so that's what kind of started me on the course of writing the right, book. Right. Here's what, what I wanted to do. I am a strong believer, at least I was then, and I probably am still now, that um, in this country we, we constantly talk about the need for a conversation on race. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I just really hate that phrase. Uh, because I think it conjures in people's mind a very particular thing, which is like a town hall meeting or like something at a convention center, mm -hmm. and there's somebody with a kind of Oprah microphone and they're going around talking to people and we're having this national conversation. 
And the reason it bothers me is because I think we're actually having conversations about race all the time in this mm -hmm. country. And saying that we need to have a conversation about race is a way of us denying that we're having a conversation Absolutely. about race. Um, and that secondly, I think that there's something really powerful about what happens in local communities. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that we had never really talked about the possibility of creating these conversations in places, in, in actual physical places where things happen, mm -hmm. right? So not like a national political conversation about race, but a conversation about race that really tried to deal with an affected community mm -hmm. and, um, and what these events did to this community. And mm -hmm. so it was beginning to imagine that that began the focus right. of the book. The piece that was most important to me, you know, when you say you're gonna write a book about lynching, and, and at that time, the lynchings had happened uh, 60 or so years before, mm -hmm. and it was, so it was possible that the lynchers were still alive, mm -hmm. people think that you are in a manhunt. So mm -hmm. the, you know, all of the electricity around me was about she's gonna find the lynchers which in fact, to be honest, I was not interested in. Mm -hmm. What I was interested in was undoing the mythology that I had learned about racial violence uh, and that probably many people learned about racial violence. I'm a New Yorker and so I, I also have a memory of lynching because it is a story that's passed down in the African American community, yeah, yeah. whether you know, you know who Emmett Till is and you, you just have this idea about lynching. And my idea about lynching was that lynching happened in the woods mm -hmm. and that it involved the Klan. Mm -hmm. And I really believed that that's what lynching was. Right. In the course of researching this book, including the two lynchings that mm -hmm. I wrote most about, I'm, I mean, so at this point I have probably read maybe three or four hundred accounts of lynching, mm -hmm. and probably seen every lynching photograph that mm -hmm. exists. Um, most of them actually happen downtown. Yeah. And very often um, exactly. outside the courthouse, that's the name of my book, exactly. On the Courthouse Lawn. Yeah. So they happen outside this place of justice. They happen in very public places. Right. And as with the lynchings that I investigated, the Klan often was not involved. Yep. Um, and what most interested me, what was most powerful, what was most devastating, and what I think is the other piece, Darren, of this conversation that's so difficult for us to get started and this truth that we have to face, is that the crowd that stood outside on a Friday night at the corner of Maine and Division in Wicomico County to watch mm -hmm. the lynching of Matthew Williams after he was dragged from Peninsula Hospital for four blocks and hung outside the courthouse was made up of members of the Wicomico County football team mm -hmm. and law students who had been in the town earlier mm -hmm. and were told, you know, if you've got any red blood in your body, come back tonight, and housewives yeah. and the owner of the pharmacy and all kinds of average people. Yep. And as you know, yeah. that's the tough nut to crack, whether we're mm -hmm. talking about Nazi Germany, yep. right? whether we're talking about mm -hmm. complicity in uh, South Africa and apartheid and the excesses of apartheid. It's, it's the role of average people. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's the powerful piece that we have to unpack. Mm -hmm. um, not, not about the individual lynchers, not the person who had the rope, not the person who lit the match, not to say that we shouldn't be interested in bringing mm -hmm. those people to justice, we should. As a, as a criminal matter, sure. but what of the crowd? What of the people who watched? And the relationship between uh, citizens and their observation of injustice, mm -hmm. to me, is like something incredibly powerful. And it is a place of shame mm -hmm. and also a place of fear. Yeah. And in that shame and fear, um, what that shame and fear produces is silence. And so what I discovered yeah. that was really very shocking to me was the way in which the story of these two lynchings had been papered over and in which there was a pact of silence mm -hmm. that you don't talk about it, that almost it was impolite. Um, and I don't mean just among black people, I mean among white, white people. people. Mm -hmm. And that white people who did try to talk about it were punished with kind of ostracism mm -hmm. um, by their neighbors for talking about this thing that contravened the story that we have in this town about who we are. Mm -hmm. And um, so I wanted to imagine how we could begin to unpack those stories. And I was particularly focused on two things. One I said was the role of average people, but the other was the role of institutions. Mm -hmm. And you know, it was the newspaper that, <laughs> when I was re researching the first lynching, the, the one in 1931, I, I, I went to the paper, uh, Matthew Williams was lynched on a Friday night, so I went to the Saturday paper to, to find the account of the lynching from the local paper, and there was, I looked at the paper and there was nothing about the lynching. And I said, I must have the wrong date. Maybe it's bi-weekly. Uh, you know, I just couldn't understand it. Um, and then I realized I was, I was looking above the fold. And there was nothing above the fold. But below the fold, 
um, was a statement. Mm -hmm. And the statement was by the two publishers of the newspaper who said um, something to the effect of, I'm paraphrasing, we will not spend time in this paper discussing the, and I remember they used the word, demonstration mm -hmm. that happened last night for the simple reason that everyone knows what happened. Right. Um, <laughs> And, and so they refused, essentially, to report on it. Mm -hmm. um, even the big town newspapers, the Baltimore Sun and so forth, they reported from a very particular perspective. Most of what we know, what I know, about these lynchings, and I know quite a bit about them, happened because of the black press, mm -hmm. because of the courage of young reporters like Clarence Mitchell writing for the right. Baltimore right. Afro-American, right. right. who drove all night uh, you yeah. know, yeah. And, yeah. and walked out the next day and began to interview people about what happened the night before. Mm -hmm. Um, so the role of institutions, the role mm -hmm. of the judicial system, the district attorneys who knew, who had affidavits indicating mm -hmm. who all of the lynchers were from the 1933 lynching, but who refused to prosecute any of them. Mm -hmm. um, so the role of institutions and institutional actors, the role of average people, <coughs> and the reason I think it's so important is because that's the way to interrupt the false narrative about who we are and mm -hmm. why it could never happen here. Uh, because if we really believe that only terrible people beat their slaves, you know, mm -hmm. or only terrible, only the Klan was involved in lynching, mm -hmm. then it allows you to create a story that implies that you could not be part of the problem, <laughs> that you could not be complicit, yeah. and but that Sarah, there's not a role for you to play. But, but it is the through line from the ways in which slave masters ensured discipline in the slaves, mm -hmm among the slaves to whip, beat, humiliate in front of a crowd mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to enforce yes. discipline and to demonstrate the repercussions yes. of crossing white people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The through line from that to your book mm -hmm. is absolutely a straight line, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it is those lynchings were in part an extension of a cultural practice to terrorize black mm -hmm. people. Yeah. And within a justice system mm -hmm. to demonstrate to us what justice looks like. No. The fact that it happened on, on the courthouse court lawn. I mean, in Liberty message. County where mm -hmm. I was, we, mm -hmm. they called it the hanging tree. Mm -hmm. They still called it the hanging mm -hmm. tree. Black folks did. Mm -hmm. White people did not, because mm -hmm. there was a there was a reality, and there is a reality of shame mm -hmm. associated with mm -hmm. it. And part of the need to to extricate ourselves of that part of the narrative is because we know how fundamentally wrong mm -hmm. it was, mm -hmm. and how that narrative cannot be reconciled, right. mm -hmm. and therefore. The silence mm -hmm. is in part about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's in part about, it's, it's a part, it's why even after hundreds of attempts to simply get our Congress to acknowledge and apologize for those lynchings, they could not pass a law. Mm -hmm. They could not, not a law, resolution. a resolution mm -hmm. until 2006. Yeah. I mean, there were, there were efforts from the 1930s, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. resolutions entered into the U.S. Congress. Every year there were resolutions and they well, the, could not get a majority of the U.S. Congress. That's one of the institutions, right? So the, the, the failure to pass anti-lynching anti legislation, mm -hmm. right, is, is about the institutional complicity of Congress in in an act that, in a, in a set of acts that, as you describe, really were message crimes. I mean, people, you know, this is this is what makes it not just a murder, which would be bad enough. Mm -hmm. What 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 makes a lynching powerful is that it's a message that you're sending to the entire community about what happens when you cross the line, about what the boundaries of citizenship are for Black people. And you're absolutely right. It's not that people don't know that it was wrong. They do know that it was wrong. And there is a, a sense mm -hmm. of, of shame about it. But, but in that silence, this mythology is created about mm -hmm. who we are. Mm -hmm. And the longer people get invested in the mythology, the harder it is to divest from right. it. So the, yeah. the, the, the thesis that I was trying to work with was, what are the components that we would need to repair the breach between, mm -hmm. you know, that exists within this right. community? Right. And 
I called it reparation because I think of yeah. reparations much more broadly, I think, than uh, in the, in the you know, normal par parlance. I think right. of the root being to repair. Right. And what does it take to repair something? If you, if you, if you uh, break a seam you know, in, a, in, your, in your pants or in your, in your dress and you want to put it back together, it's a process. Right. It's a process of looking at how serious the breach is of determining whether the material can be put back together, finding the right thread that matches, um, and then creating stitches that are fine enough that it doesn't. So think about the process of repairing. Mm -hmm. and, in, and I think that that's how I think about repairing. I don't think about it being, you know, writing a check. Mm -hmm. I think about a process. And then what are the components of that process? I think the first component that, that, that begins the process is truth telling. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to confront the truth. But then I think there are other elements of that process as well. And, the, you know, the public identification that Brian now talks about of um, places where lynchings happened is one of the things that I write about in the book, that I would be on the courthouse lawn and there would be, you know, a, a statue of a, sometimes a Confederate soldier. There would be a, a, a cannon, you know, from some general. There would be a tree that was donated by the Ladies' Garden Club and that would be it. Mm -hmm. There would be nothing that would suggest that 2,000 people had been swarming around here a half a century ago trying to kill someone. Right. And so I thought that, well, this is not telling the truth about what this space really means. Right. And that what you do need uh, are some ways of informing the public about the contested nature right. of the public space in these towns. What, I, I think this, these are, you're, you're getting very much at the heart of a number of important issues. By the way, Tulsa, I think, is also a very important example of where economically, yes. African Americans well. did quite well mm -hmm. course, and completely burned right. out, mm -hmm. just totally burned out. The example I used back from 1898 was the extinguishment of voting rights for African Americans in the South because it was Wilmington, Wilmington Texans, mm -hmm. Texas, and this place in mm -hmm. South Carolina mm -hmm. I, I mentioned. One of the questions that I wanted to get to, which I think is raised by both of your comments, if we look at truth telling, which is essential to transitional justice. Uh, one of the key components that we look at in all the countries that we're working in is it would be kind of unforeseeable right now given our national situation to have it on a national level. But we have had some experiences on the local level. Um, there was one in Greensboro, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. I was in Chapel Hill when that mm -hmm. killing happened. I remember it quite well. It's a quite a contested situation. Um, Canada has had a truth commission on, uh, on the enforced uh, uh, education of, uh, of Native uh, Canadians or First Canadians. Um, and there have been some other, so there's an interesting experiment in North Carolina, again, my home state. Uh, there is a Citizens <coughs> Truth Commission which is looking at um, uh, extraordinary renditions out of Fort Bragg. Um, so another, yeah. so there are a number of local, um, not statewide, but local uh, initiatives. Is this an experience or uh, that might be useful in attack, attacking these issues? I don't think that, unless you think that uh, we could make progress on the national level, it certainly doesn't look like, I mean, I know Tuesday went a little bit better than a year ago, uh, but uh, uh, the political space looks pretty narrow, but do other transitional justice processes and maybe work on a state level or a, a national level or a local I mean, I think that it's, level. Um, I, we will get to yeah. talking about solutions, but I do have to just yeah. say, you know, it, um, the, 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 a key function, um, a key element of transitional justice mm -hmm. processes is public education. Mm -hmm. Public, the truth telling and and the alignment of all of the mechanisms of educating the public um, is essential mm -hmm. to what the truth right. is. And that is really hard. Um, that is really hard because, I mean, in my home state of Texas, the State Board of Education uh, has directed uh, that uh, the uh, school books that teach slavery mm -hmm. do not um, say enslaved people. Um, 
it is they, they have uh, constructed some terminology that uh, softens the blow mm -hmm. of, of what actually happened. And as a result of that, because Texas is such an important um, uh, consumer in the educational publication marketplace, uh, the power of Texas to tip the balance of what is actually in textbooks mm -hmm. um, about slavery, right? I mean, yeah. so in Germany, when you are in elementary school, you are told a consistent narrative of what your country did. Mm -hmm. Every German child learns that there was a period in Germany history when their country perpetrated evil and they are taught that it was evil. Mm -hmm. And there is no uh, lack of clarity about the, the effort to ensure a consistent education about the country's history. We don't, we don't have that because we still mm -hmm. are fighting the battle of that history and what truth is vis-a-vis -vis that history. And so we have to fight that fight mm -hmm. Uh, at the local level, especially, because that's where education happens. So it's a political fight, really, at the local level, or it's a, a fight for the truth at the local level? Absolutely. How, how you, yeah. I mean, it, is, it, is, it has to be fought both at the local mm -hmm. level and at the federal level, because mm -hmm. the, the levers mm -hmm. that we need to pull are in both places. And I think the, you know, we need a truth commission that is led by white people mm -hmm. who themselves have histories like yours with families who recognize that um, our history, their history, mm -hmm. um, is not something to be fully proud of. And it's, listen, it's really, really hard when I was, a, a, in college, I was a page at the Texas legislature, mm -hmm. and I used to give these tours. And there was, in the rotunda, there were a series of, of markers put up during the 1920s and 30s by the sons and daughters of the Confederacy. And they explicitly said, the Civil War was about, hold up, and there were two lines that said, it was not about slavery. No, subtle, subtle, no, subtle. seriously, the no, no. there was a I line believe that was, you. I mean, it I was know. not about yeah. slavery, yeah. right? And it was, yeah. it was really important that those markers be installed mm -hmm. because they allowed people to absolve themselves mm -hmm. of what the record, the public record, completely contradicts. Yeah. I mean, the public record in Texas was that it was absolutely about slavery. Right. I mean, that, that was a critical element and a preservation of a Southern way of life, yeah. which included slavery. Right. And so the heart, like, so you're saying to yourself, why would people go to this extreme mm -hmm. to manufacture literally stones that like markers that are so contradicted by the public record mm -hmm. because it's so necessary to, to the history that people want to see. No, it wasn't about slavery. Mm -hmm. How many times have people argued about what was the, ori the original sin, mm -hmm. the genocide right. of Native mm -hmm. Americans? Yeah. I mean, when you say that word that we perpetrated a genocide, mm -hmm. it, there are people who just recoil at the idea that there was a genocide on, I mean, that that's just not, uh, that's, that's not processable. Mm -hmm. So, and I agree, I mean, if you look at the Genocide Convention, it's completely met in terms of Native Americans. Um, but we come back to this, idea of a conversation about race, and I think, as you both have said, this conversation by, about race, I don't know whether it's a dead end or it's, it's not taking us where we need to go. How do we 
change that? What are the, what, what, obviously politically is part, politics is part of it, but the driving force for, in all countries, ultimately for progressive change is civil society. It's driven by activists like yourselves um, and a lot of people in this room. How do we begin to drive that process in the in the right in the right direction? You know what? So it's yeah. a, it's, a, it's a great question you're asking, yeah. um, and it, it really compels us to answer the question of who's driving the conversation. Is it one set of people driving right. the conversation, or is there multiple drivers at the same time? Right. Um, I think we are having the conversation, and, and there are moments when it is incredibly powerful and dynamic and we are having as close to a national conversation about race as we could. Mm -hmm. I think that um, in the months, certainly in the weeks and most, most profoundly in the days after the video emerged of Walter Scott running in that park mm -hmm. in North Char Charleston, South Carolina and being shot in the back, we were having a national conversation about race mm -hmm. because there was truth telling. There, you couldn't get away from what you saw it wasn't a trick of the eye. There was no way to deny what it was. It mm -hmm. was what it was. Mm -hmm. We saw the police officer. We saw him drop whatever he dropped. We, we saw the whole thing. And there was a moment of honesty that mm -hmm. was happening mm -hmm. in the country that there was a problem. Right. And these moments do happen, and they do drive something. Now, it's messy, mm -hmm. right? So I think that's what I meant about the kind of impatience of what repair looks like. Right, and yeah. we're still in that conversation. Right. And it's messy. Right now, that conversation has taken the form of NFL players kneeling about police violence. So we're still mm -hmm. in that conversation, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and so it's not over. It's not a night at a convention center. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a process in which we have to confront something that is hard and real and true and violent and we have to figure out who we are in relation to that and then what are we going to do about it. Mm -hmm. And that's the process that we're in, mm -hmm. for example, right now around the right. issue of uh, police violence against unarmed African Americans. Stop and frisk was part of that conversation, mm -hmm. right? And when, and when New Yorkers read that op-ed from, from Nicholas Pert describing the many times that he had been stopped and frisked as a young man, there was, that was part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I want to suggest that um, that we, that we are always having a conversation about race at mm -hmm. one time or another. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's more productive than others, but we are, but we are definitely engaged in the conversation. Mm -hmm. What is scary at this moment is that we are in a conflict and a conversation about what is truth. Right. This and is so a critical an, point. And so that's a fascinating time in which to be trying to engage in truth telling. Right. When the very notion of truth and facts mm -hmm. have been contested mm -hmm. by the highest leaders in mm -hmm. your country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think that's one of the, the grave challenges that we face. I remember when my book came out, you know, I heard rumors, um, because I, I'm very honest about the role of the prosecutors, who clearly did not want to prosecute even when they knew who the lynchers was, were in this community. And the grandson of one of the prosecutors, you know, the rumor came out, he says he's writing a book. And I was like, bring it on. You know, let's, <laughs> I'm, I'm good for the contested narrative, right? right? But, right. And, and it hasn't materialized, but, yeah, yeah. but I think that that idea that, that you, you're unafraid to mm -hmm. get in the place of ideas and facts and say, let's mm -hmm. talk about this. Mm -hmm. you know, I, can, I can show you my research. I've got, this, I've got 600 footnotes here that right. you, know, right. you can go look for. Um, that's one kind of you know, truth where you really are documenting it. And that's part of why I did it. I created right. it as a, as a gift to that community so that they could have the conversation without the, um, what I knew would be the, you know, the effort to try to deny that it ever happened. Yep, yep. Um, but at this moment, when a lot of energy is being put towards making people believe that there's not such a thing as truth, truth yeah. I think this is a very um, destabilizing moment for the, for the process of having these, it, it can happen in the policing piece, and I talked about Walter Scott, because you saw that video, mm -hmm. right? And, right. And, but in the absence of something that you know, tangible, powerful, that we could all see, um, I'm very concerned about mm -hmm. the way in which there is an approach to truth and not an approach to truth. And Darren mm -hmm. just talked about it in the context yeah. of uh, you know, textbooks. But we've been doing this from the beginning of the country. If you read the Constitution and you start reading, I used to do this with my students. I used to say, you know, raise your hand the first time you, you find the word, you know, the, the word that's about slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and as you know, the, the framers of the Constitution were very particular to walk around the use of that, that word. The importation of persons, 
the importation of persons, persons yeah. the yeah. migration and importation right. of persons, yeah. and three-fifths of all other persons. I mean, there are all kinds of ways in which the framers were, were trying not to use that Absolutely. word. They knew what the moral implications. So there's mm. been a covering yeah. that, we, that we are in the habit of doing this. And it's very hard to undo that habit. And I think we're in a dangerous moment right now when truth and facts are being challenged um, in and of themselves, mm -hmm. which makes mm -hmm. having these conversations even more difficult. Huge issue for us as a, as a country. And uh, Darren, you, you face this every day. This, uh... No, I think, I think it's a huge issue. And I think um, for, for America to really reconcile these issues, um, in this moment is very challenging mm -hmm. because the moment we are in is a moment of growing inequality and insecurity. And the times at which we have made the greatest progress in this country have been times um, of, of increasing shared prosperity, yeah. That's right. of a sense that the pie is expanding and so mm -hmm. Sure, let them have some of the pie now. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, there, there are there are ways in which we we must take into account the environment, the degree to which the environment is enabling, and the environment today mm -hmm. um, is actually quite disenabling. Mm -hmm. uh, it it is hard to get working class white people to talk about mm -hmm. the problems and the histories of racism and challenges and black and brown men coming out of prison when they themselves feel that they are um, increasingly at risk and at risk for something this country has never experienced, which is an entire generation of downwardly mobile white people. Mm -hmm. We've never experienced that in this country. And we are um, on the cusp of experiencing that. And so that is not an environment in which, mm -hmm. because that population, just as it was in Germany, just as it was in South, in South Africa particularly, was an essential part of the transition, was an, right. an essential part of the truth. They, in fact, led some of the truth telling about what their families had done. And and so it's really hard. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I, I find that to be the thing that is uh, most but you, problematic. But you, but you know, our, our, our problem with, with confronting the role of, of race in our society actually makes it less likely that we can get out of even the economic uh, picture that you're painting. Um, because what it will take to create the kind of upward mobility mobility that you're uh, describing is the willingness to invest in, to massively invest in key portions of our society that produce upward mobility. You identified education as being one of them, right? Absolutely. So, um, so this is where the, 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 the question about reconciliation and reparations mm -hmm. meets the pragmatic which is about money. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we should never assume that these two do not have a connection to each other because policy in our country is made up of what things we value and therefore decide to invest in. Mm -hmm. And those investments can create the conditions of the kind of upward mobility that Darren is identifying. So after World War II, we made a decision that we were going to invest in the creation of a white middle class. Um, many of these GIs who were coming back from the war, white GIs who were coming back from the war were working class young men. Their parents were working class under the standards that were used in those days. They could have never purchased their own home. Um, they, they did not have access mm -hmm. to quality education and so forth. And a decision, a policy decision was made to invest in the creation of the white middle class. Mm -hmm. And we did that through the GI Bill so right. that returning soldiers could become educated so that right. they could have access to housing. Um, we invested in the creation of the white suburbs. We created an interstate highway system, massive investment, gave tax breaks to the creation of white suburban enclaves like Levittown that Levittown. didn't even let black people live right. there. And at the same time destroyed black neighborhoods. And at the same time mm -hmm. destroyed it's black neighborhoods in, in order process. to create all these pathways right. to this to white middle class dumb. 
That, mm -hmm. was, a, that was an investment yeah. that we decided to make. Now let's take away the racism and, and, and imagine that we decided to actually create an investment today, right, to deal with this downward mobility that you're, that you're talking about, not just of whites, but of everyone. We, we can decide it anytime mm -hmm. we want to. Mm -hmm. But what's gonna make you make that decision is your willingness to confront the truth mm -hmm. and your willingness to reconcile yourself to the problems that are actually dragging you down. Mm -hmm. And this is where I think America has always kind of lost its way, which is that we've always regarded the idea of ending uh, structural racism and dealing with the issue of racism as something that would only benefit black people. Mm -hmm. And we've never talked about the way in which it is a cancer exactly. eating at our exactly. society in ways that I think we're seeing today, in which the question is being called. We can't even embrace fully what we thought were shared democratic values because racism keeps getting in the way. Yeah. And because the feel good of racism keeps getting in the way. So when, when, when the Supreme Court decided the Brown versus Board of Education case, and they talked about the harm of segregation on black children, they left out something that had been introduced into the case by the lawyers at the Legal Defense Fund and by the social scientists who wrote a brief in that case, um, accompanying the, the lawyers' briefs in that case, that talked about the harm of segregation to white children mm -hmm. and the way in which white children yeah. are, um, are morally confused mm -hmm. by, um, by uh, racial oppression. Uh, the way in which they are, um, they are perceive of themselves um, in ways that are not true because they're in this uneven playing field. I mean, there was a whole discussion about that. Does it make it into the Supreme Court's decision in Brown and thus the project of integrating our schools has been since then seen as something nice to do for black children? Mm -hmm. Not something that we needed to do for the education of future citizens of this country. In the Brown case, the Supreme Court said that education is the very foundation of citizenship, mm -hmm. right? So here we talk today about whether people have civics and you know, whether people understand what it means to be a citizen. We have been educating uh, the future citizens in a warped system. Mm -hmm. But if we decided that we didn't want that anymore, that for the future mm -hmm. of the integrity of our democracy, for the future of the strength of this country, we were gonna make investments that actually produced mm -hmm. a citizenship that was prepared to live and work together in teams, to lead in a pluralistic democracy, we would make certain kinds of investments. Mm -hmm. And one of the investments we would make would be in a public education system that really was the foundation of citizenship. Mm -hmm. It would be in creating conditions of housing and jobs and so forth that created pathways and opportunity for people to be able to develop themselves as strong citizens in our democracy. That's a decision, and I want to stress that that decision is not contingent upon some money falling from the sky, because when 30, 40 years ago, really 30 years ago, we decided to make certain kinds of massive investments, we did it. And we invested in how to deal with our poverty pro pro problem, how to deal with our joblessness problem, how to deal with our race problem, how to deal with mental illness, and that investment was called the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. That's what we decided to invest in, mm -hmm. it was a decision. And you know, so it was expanding the court systems, you needed the DAs, you needed the judges, you needed the courthouses, you need the prisons, you need the private prisons, you need all of the apparatus that allows this um, uh, uh, criminal complex to yeah, exist. Right. But that's a decision. Mm -hmm. And so today, part of this transitional justice, because I think people sometimes think it's just about talking. It's, yeah. it's not just about talking. Yeah. There is a pivot to action. Yeah. And the pivot to action is where you identify what your values are and then you make investments that are consistent with those values that are about yeah. the future of the country you want it to be. Not yeah. what, was, what happened in the past, but what you want to have happen in the future. So politically, as a country, we need to make a different, we need to, we need to change course in terms of our criminal justice system. We need to reform our criminal justice. This system, this is hardly unique. Uh, we see this in all the country, many of the countries that we work in. Um, the, the, both the criminal justice system, the policing, these are key elements. They're signs, to, yes. They're, they're both signs and mm -hmm. ultimately solutions if you make the but right changes. they were changes. also constructed. Yeah. It was also, again, It was, yeah. Mm -hmm. Michelle Alexander as, makes this. As, uh, yeah. as Cheryl and, and Michelle and yeah. Brian and Ava DuVernay, I mean, yeah. as so many people have yeah. demonstrated, right. the straight line from the 13th Amendment yeah. where to the surprise and astonishment yeah. of so many Americans, yep. uh, it it did not it did not um, free all the slaves. Yeah. It did not 
say that this would be a nation where people uh, uh, can no longer be enslaved. It okay. explicitly said that we, slavery is illegal except in the case of those who have committed a crime. The 13th Amendment mm -hmm. explicitly mm -hmm. says that you can be enslaved mm -hmm. if you have committed a crime. And there is a straight line, again, from that policy choice to the construction of this system of, of enslavement that we have today. And, and those choices um, have been racially motivated. Right? And, and I think that's, so when you say to someone, mm -hmm. read Halderman's <laughs> interview mm -hmm. when he got out of prison with the reporter at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution where he says mm -hmm. why the war on drugs mm -hmm. came to be. Mm -hmm. as, a, as a specific response to blacks and hippies who were the two enemies, community of enemies of the Nixon administration. And a We're all in trouble up here. Pernicious, <laughs> pernicious effort to construct, to demonize and marginalize an entire community of people yeah. uh, based on a racist objective. And so when you say to people, yeah. this is this is why we have this system, people really have a hard time. Mm -hmm. but, but, but here's the thing I think is so important. This is why I keep talking about having, making decisions and choices. It's not inevitable. Like there was a decision, as you just described, to create something. And that happened at a mm -hmm. real moment. We can like, identify the moments when mm -hmm. certain decisions yeah. were made yeah. to do certain kinds of things. And the reason I emphasize this is because you could make decisions and you can unmake decisions. Yes. You could also decide to go another way. Yeah. And, and what I think is worrisome is that um, we just accept the landscape as yeah. though it's inevitable. And mm -hmm. this is why I love this um, new book by Richard Rothstein, The Color of Law, who's a, a right, fellow right, at LDF yeah. Thurgood Marshall right. Institute, you know, who talks, and, and the book is really all about the policies of the federal government that created segregated housing in the North. Mm -hmm. If you haven't read it, you should read it. It's called mm -hmm. The Color of Law. Right. And whatever community you were from um, in the North, you will you will never look at it the same because you will understand how federal government policy created the physical exactly. landscape that you probably exactly. take as you know perfectly exactly. normal. Like this yeah. is the village, right. and then over there is Soho, and then like and you and you think that you just kind of received this like it came from the sky, right. but it's actually the creation of deliberate and affirmative government policies. And the, the power of understanding that is just not so you can be blown away and say, oh my gosh, what a racist country, or you know, look at this history. It's to, to understand that these are all decisions mm -hmm. that get made. And, and what's our role? What decisions are we making mm -hmm. at this moment? We are constantly mm -hmm. making decisions and investments. And we have the power to make different kinds of decisions than we made in the past. But if we pretend that it's all just inevitable, that you know, of course there's a war on drugs, and of course you know, people violate yeah. the law, of course they gotta go to prison, and of course they have to go to prison for life, and of course there has to be a death penalty, and of course black people live on this side of the town, and white people live on this mm -hmm. side of the town, and of course this school is better because it's a wealthier school district, and that we, we treat those things as though they are inevitable, as though they must be, mm -hmm. when in fact there are decisions that make those things true. Mm -hmm. But part of that is elections have consequences, right? In 1968, Richard Nixon gets elected on a law and order ticket. Mm -hmm. Much of that is implemented by his administration, continued, continues on Reagan, et cetera. So the politics of it is mm -hmm. very important. And the reality, because, yeah. because I can assure you that there are, if we brought an economist up onto this yeah. stage, he would tell us that you and I are crazy, mm -hmm. that, um, that actually um, we don't have any more money to spend. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so um, we, uh, we, uh, th there isn't a choice to be made mm -hmm. because our federal debt is so high mm -hmm. that every year the amount of discretionary funding available mm -hmm. for to make choices mm -hmm. um, is is going to be uh, reduced. But they would say we could cut taxes, or oh no, well, they, well, of course they would, of course they would, of course they would. I'm I'm simply saying 
that mm. we, we have to recognize that we operate in a context mm -hmm. where, where the forces that would be marshaled against the better choice making. Mm -hmm. and, and again, part of this is not about um, racism. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's really important here because we're really, we, Cheryl and I have been talking about a black white dynamic, but there are immigrants. The, the, the reality here is that this isn't Very just about point. black and white people. Very important right? point. It yes. is really important to underscore that. And the, the challenge here is, is not that it is um, all about um, racism, um, it is about elitism and mm -hmm. classism mm -hmm. as well because it intersects sure. with ways that really uh, I find uh, very problematic. And so, you know, I, I know black people who sometimes, because they are now successful, sound incredibly like a lot of successful white people I know when it comes to their kids getting into the Ivy League school that they went to, mm -hmm. and you know them, them having a house in, in the vineyard on the summer, and all of the, I mean, just go down the list, right. and they then they want those privileges, they want a tax system that allows them to buy a second house and write off the the right. the, yeah. the interest. Right. I mean, and this is my point, right? The, the systems that 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 undergird our yeah. capacity to make the better choices are not just race-based systems. They're systems in which, which intersect with race, mm -hmm. but these larger trends around inequality is the enabler or not. Yeah. And so we can't, I, I can't talk about this issue of race in this moment and not understand these larger trends that are disabling our ability to make progress on race. We, uh, I'm doing a terrible job of moderating because time is running and no. oh, we, oh, we wanted to take some questions uh, from yes. the audience. Um, and I had one last question, but I'm going to reserve it till the end and let's take three, three quick questions. There's one here, one here, and oh, let's just take, let's take the, these two over here and then one up here. Yeah. Hi, good evening. My name is Rebecca Neustadt. I'm the director of the policing program at the Vera Institute of Justice. Hi. Thank Hi. you for this really important discussion and for the incredible work that you're all doing. Um, Gwen, you spoke a little bit about... Sherilyn. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sherilyn, I'm sorry. <laughs> Dear cousin. You spoke about the prosecutor's um, sort of lack of action um, in, in your book and in lynching cases more generally. Um, I'm wondering if, if, if all of you could speak a little bit about the role of police, both historically as well as today, in truth and reconciliation. Okay, thanks. Um, and you, I'm here. He's on our advisory board, so he gets to. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, like she just said, uh, for speaking truth to power and letting us be witness to it. Um, my question is, what do you imagine a uh, truth and reconciliation process or commission in the United States, given everything you're saying, what could that look like? Because you're, you've said tonight, and I think this is very powerful, that it has to be local, it has to be broadly participatory, it has to be uncomfortable, it has to lead to change and action. Can that exist today, given who's running our government? Could it exist in a way that's funded by philanthropy? Could it exist in a state level? in Virginia, if the House delegate switches. Um, <laughs> can that happen now? Uh, and what would that look like? And a, a related question, um, looking backwards, why did that not happen in the last administration? Mm -hmm. Okay, one more. Good, great question. One more question, if we can. Yeah. Um, hi, good evening. My name is Brian Lewis, and I'm the director of a paid uh, internship development program called Exalt Youth okay. in downtown Brooklyn. Um, I have a question about social media, uh, because in the work that I do, um, we have a lot of young people who are being essentially um, prosecuted through their involvement in social media. So through profiles on Facebook and Snapchat, um, you know, we're finding that a lot of young people are becoming more deeply involved in the criminal justice system through behavior that's being criminalized online. Um, so I wonder what your thoughts are about that. How can we? use the transitional justice or racial justice model to combat some of these tendencies that we see. And then um, I, I also see 
that it's not only with the young people who are being criminalized and put in jail because of these social media profiles, but obviously social media has such a huge impact on the last election, um, on the way that we're continuing to see meet, you know, race in this country. So, I mean, you bring up the, the examples of Flandreau Castile and all these other things that we see on social media every day, but I feel like there's this other side of um, the way that social media is continuing to bring about racial okay. injustice as well. So I'm just curious what your thoughts Thanks. are. Thanks. Um, well, I'll start with the please, last question. Please, yeah. um, just because I, I am, um, we've, one of the things we've started at the foundation is a, is a work on, on internet rights, a new program on internet rights. And in part, it's because uh, the internet truly is going to be a battleground for justice. And, um, and our institutions, particularly the institutions that have been set up to protect the rights of people of color and, and uh, minority and marginalized, are, are way behind the curve in understanding uh, the potentially pernicious impacts of, of technology. And uh, the larger world um, of things like predictive analytics and computational propaganda and these things that are happening that in some ways migrate the injustice in our analog world in the new digital world. I mean, it's just replicating. It's just doing it faster at an accelerated uh, way and in ways that are seemingly irreversible. And, and those, are the, those are the means through which decisions get made um, about um, who should be prosecuted. Um, the, the data sets that are used are based, are historical data. Um, the, those historical data are not neutral. Um, they come with the historical biases that we have in data in the analog world. And they're now just being uh, transitioned. And so, I believe that until um, we all understand that we've all got to be in, if you're, if you're in the fight for justice, you've got to be on the internet fighting for justice. And it's one of the reasons why we have supported many of the organizations we, we have supported for many years who five or six years ago brought many of the civil rights organizations into a room. No one had uh, a technologist on staff, for example. I mean, you're working on predatory lending, and you don't understand that there is more predators on the internet every day ripping off our people than, than the world in which you are set up for to actually mm -hmm. uh, engage in. So I just think that it's a huge issue. I think um, until we get rights organizations and justice organizations and lawyers um, uh, understanding the, the intersections of, of these disciplines, um, computer science and technology and law and engineering. Um, again, this is why we've got to have a space for new ideas. Um, and I just think about this a lot at, at Ford. Um, short answer to the question here about social media. It's really a matter of tremendous concern. Um, here again is where we have uh, created a new space, a new kind of public space and the people who created that new public space um, are actually very deeply uninformed about the reality of the history of this country and, and racism and so forth. And maybe even were unconcerned about it in the creation of this new exciting thing. And we were all told that if we do any kind of regulation, we're gonna interfere with the innovation of these extraordinarily bright people. Uh, and I think that we're at a moment where we can see just as Darren described, the way in which this new public space replicates all of the issues that we see in the physical public space, including the kind of targeting and um, hmm. you know, issues that are happening on social media around young people in this city and other young cities. So I don't actually think that's an issue for transitional justice. That's actually an issue for litigation. And, mm -hmm. and the question is, how do you do it? Because of course, you know, the, the, the internet creates really serious problems that go even deeper than what we have found in our work, which is that there is a presumption that there is not bias, right? There's a presumption that it's neutral. It um, and, and that's really kind of dangerous. Um, and it's also true that people are creating themselves in this space 
um, in ways that may not actually even be the real them, right? That the whole point of social media for some people is that you get to be this person um, in this space that then becomes attributed, let's say, by a law enforcement officer who's monitoring your social media to you when in fact it may not be you, right? When in fact it's the equivalent of you know, what, what, what you would say in a you know, Caribbean parade is playing mas, you know? Um, so we haven't really figured all of that out and how you would turn that into a process of litigating around some of that targeted, targeting, but very important issue and agree with you that um, it's one about which we're kind of deeply concerned and we spent actually two hours yesterday talking about algorithms and al algorithmic discrimination and trying to catch up on the learning that Darren is talking about. The question here about what these conversations would look like um, and why they didn't happen in the last administration. Why they didn't happen in the last, they'd happened in the administration two, two, two times before. Remember President Clinton had a national commission on race, the One America Commission led by John Hope Franklin and went all around the country. Many of you probably don't remember it, but it did happen. Uh, and went all around the country having conversations about the history of racism and so forth. Um, and so, uh, and, and actually my reading of that report is what convinced me that these conversations needed to happen at a more local level. Mm -hmm. um, and. I think they can and I think they do actually happen. Um, there have been nascent reconciliation, truth and reconciliation mm -hmm. efforts in communities around the country. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, Lexington, Kentucky, mm -hmm. of the, 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 whatever is the main newspaper in Lexington, I can't remember the, the name Courier, of it. Courier, I think. Yeah, right? yeah, actually did a whole process in which they mm -hmm recognized and spoke truth about their role during the civil rights movement in not reporting on the civil rights movement, which was their decision. Their decision during the civil rights movement mm -hmm. is that they would not report on any of the local civil rights activities that were happening. So just a news blackout. Um, and they decided to do a whole process mm -hmm. of reconciling with that past and actually doing the stories today that they should have done then about what was happening in their community. Or in um, Virginia, um, you'll remember as, a, as part of massive resistance to mm -hmm. Brown, the mm -hmm. Prince Edward County yeah. uh, School Board closed the schools of Prince Edward County, Virginia for five years mm -hmm. rather than uh, yep. integrate their schools. As a result of that, many young children did not receive an education. Um, the schools were closed for five years. Black families who had relatives in other places could send their kids to go to school, but many were never educated. When the schools reopened, um, try to imagine if the schools had closed when you were 13 and now you're 18, do you want to go back to the eighth grade? Probably not, and so many people were not educated. Uh, the legislature of Virginia, this is maybe 10 years ago, maybe eight or nine years ago actually, uh, created a fund um, for students who had not been educated in that process to be able to go to college if they wished to, to go to community college and to support them going to college to get the education that they were denied during that period. These are small little mm -hmm. things but I, I do want people to know that there, there have been mm -hmm. efforts to try and reconcile with some aspects um, of, of the past. It, out on the Eastern Shore, the first chapter of, the book, in, of my book, mm -hmm. I wrote about the controversy over uh, the, the effort to try to put a statue of Frederick Douglass on the courthouse lawn of the Talbot County Courthouse. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was vehemently opposed, if you can believe it. So Frederick Douglass had been a slave out on the Eastern Shore. He uh, actually had been jailed right at the jail there in the courthouse in Talbot County. He returned to Talbot County later when he was a free man and met with the sheriff who had jailed him. Uh, you know, this is, he's like the, the most famous son of Talbot County. And yet, um, they did not want a statue of him on the courthouse lawn because they said the courthouse lawn was a hallowed ground um, preserved only for the statutes of, uh, statues of those who had served in the war. Uh, and so there's a Confederate monument, of course, on the, on the uh, courthouse lawn. And the first chapter of my book is about an attempted lynching that took place there in which 2,000 people tried to kill a black man in 1919, Isaiah Fountain. And so I wanted to challenge the whole idea of this as hallowed ground. Well, they actually did do the Frederick Douglass statue and it, they had a very big um, and very powerful ceremony um, in which they dedicated this statue um, on the courthouse lawn to kind of reconcile themselves with that past. So, I just, I, I want to suggest that some of these things are happening. I think we should be pushing for them to happen in local jurisdictions. Um, I think that there are places that we, you know, Baltimore should have one. Like we're taking mm -hmm. down Confederate statues, but you know, when I first moved to Baltimore, people would say, well, we didn't have slavery here. What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Like, of course, of course, you know, Maryland wasn't a slave state. Well, it's like, where, are, where was Harriet Tubman from? Mm -hmm. Where was right. Frederick Douglass from, right? So there are places where I think this, these conversations can, um, can happen and should happen. And then the role of police, this is the same unbroken line mm -hmm. of slave catchers and, and local constabularies and um, particularly in the post-reconstruction period, the use of, of police to um, prosecute these vagrancy laws, the black codes that really were kind of the beginning of the creation of the prison industrial complex. 
um, to try and essentially return blacks to a, a condition of, of slavery by having them arrested for kind of minor uh, vagrancy infractions. Um, but look, here's the thing. We could talk about that history forever. The reality, and I think this is what President Obama did try to do, is to say it's now the 21st century. What are the police, what, what is public safety, what should it look like for the 21st century? And that means breaking with the nostalgia, even, I mean, even in communities where I do work and African Americans talk about officer friendly and how we knew him when he was to patrol the neighborhood. I mean, we should have a, comp maybe, maybe we want officer friendly, maybe we don't, right? So may maybe we want our kids to play midnight basketball with police officers, I really don't. Um, I, I, I want them to play midnight basketball with teachers and counselors and members of their faith community and so forth. What, what do we need in the 21st century? What's, what makes the ideal police officer? Maybe it's not the big burly guy, maybe it's not Officer Krepke, maybe it's actually a, a brilliant communicator. Maybe it's someone with a fully formed ego and, and a, a strong sense of themselves. Maybe it's someone with a commitment and passion for young people in public service. Like that would be a different, and we could invest in an education system that would educate that kind of police force, right? Um, we could do all of those things. Um, and simply talking about what it used to be like, whether we think what it used to be like was good um, or whether we think it was bad, doesn't really get us to what I think is the question confronting us today, which is in the 21st century, what, what does the, the current um, challenge we face in public safety, what does that require to engage? Um, and some of it is about police. Police are not the whole answer to public safety. Mm -hmm. Public safety is really about communities. Um, but but the, for the role police play, who should they be and how would we get that police force? I would love to see us having, and I think we were beginning yeah. to have that kind of conversation uh, that, that Attorney General Jeff Sessions believes is not necessary and wants to take us to a kind of retro place of the 1980s, which ultimately I think won't work because this is one of those circumstances in which locally the train has left the station and I think there are many jurisdictions that recognize that they have to move forward. But mm -hmm. it, it is still gonna be a struggle because obviously the federal government has a kind of outside influence around you know, some of these issues. Yeah. And I think the importance of, some, of emphasizing the local mm -hmm. uh, Local school boards have a lot of control. Local mayors, local city councils. Mm -hmm. And when you look at some other thing, in Greensboro, the, as I mentioned earlier, the Truth Commission is established by the city council. So addressing the past doesn't always have to be on the federal level or even the state level. And I think that's one of the things that's happened in this country is that those who are, at least in my view, on the right side of things have forgotten about local politics, the local struggles, and think it's all about electing the president. Well, as we can see, electing the president can be a, a very important element, but there are struggles to be carried out on every level. And the countries we work in, we see this. You know? We see civil society struggling on all the levels of government um, and in, ensuring that pressure is maintained. And I would come back to the point, you know, Change doesn't happen without pressure. Change doesn't happen without progressive forces, like in the civil rights movement, like in, across, in many, many places around the world, pushing for change. And it's got to be at the local level, in the US, the state level, yeah, if you, if and you, so forth. Yeah. If you think about some of the most egregious figures that we think yeah. of from the civil rights movement, these were all local elected officials. Bull Connor, right? I mean, you know, yeah, Bull yeah, Connor and, yeah. Uh, you know, and Governor Faubers, and you know, okay. it, 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 those, those are the people that we think of. And I think today, you know, Sheriff Arpaio, and you know, there, it, there's still this power of the local elected official. And Darren talking about the Texas uh, uh, textbooks, you know, the Texas school board. Um, you know, look when you when you talk to somebody who says they're interested in politics and they're going to run for office. You, you probably always are asking, you know, are they going to run for mayor? Are they going to be, uh, are they going to be the governor? You know, are they going to be the senator? Why isn't the school board a sexy thing yeah. to run for right. when yeah. you're going to control the textbooks exactly. that children exactly. all over the country are going to use? My my daughters had those awful textbooks that mm -hmm. described yeah. nullification mm -hmm. without referring to the civil rights movement. I mean, it was we had a battle in the school mm -hmm. to deal with it. So just that school board, the power that they have to affect how our history is taught all across the country is yeah. extraordinary, but we don't think of that as a place where we would put our best and our brightest to go run for school board elections. So I'm, I'm looking for many of you to be running for the school board yes. in the next year and others for city council and state legislature. And we're out of time. Uh, we, I wish this could go on for hours, but I wanna thank our host. I wanna thank everybody who's done so, so much great work uh, to put this together. And mostly, I wanna thank our fantastic panelists 
who uh, are great to talk with, and I wish we had another three or four hours. So we'll do it again. Thank so thanks very much.